Welcome back, everyone, to another reaction video. Uh, well, we're going to get into some more history buffs today, uh, where he covers, and I hope he praises, what I think is one of the all-time greatest war movies ever made, 1970s Waterloo. Uh, I, I don't want to say too much ahead of time, because I'm sure he's going to cover a lot of what went into making this movie. But suffice it to say, especially in light of the, the latest movie about Napoleon, this thing shines, man. I mean, this was a really, really good movie, and I don't know that we'll ever see anything like it again just because of the number of extras involved and how they did everything with practical effects for the most part. So uh, I'm excited to see how he covers this and what he has to say. We'll talk a little bit about the history, but also talk about what I think, as I said, is one of the all-time great war movies. The link is in the description to the original content if you want to check it out without my commentary. If you're not already familiar with History Buffs, and you should be, he's got almost, what, he's got a little over a million and a half subscribers now. Really what he's all about is... Uh, taking TV shows and movies about history and then talking about the real history, what they get right, what they get wrong, things like that. Uh, so let's see what he has to say about Waterloo. Like the intro Hello music. and welcome history buffs. My name is Nick Hodges, and you may think I'm a bit of a hipster for saying this, but they don't make him like they used to. Amen. I am, of course, talking about Waterloo. Absolutely. If you're like me and you're getting sick and tired of this oversaturation of CGI in our Hollywood movies, then boy do I have a film for you. Waterloo is, without a doubt, one of the greatest historical war films you will ever see in your entire life. I'm so glad to hear him praise this movie as much as I have because he's absolutely right this I mean this and, and it's 50 years old now it's over 50 years old man it's so good made in 1970 by Soviet director Sergei Bondarchuk this is an extremely faithful on-screen adaptation of the Battle of Waterloo and when I say faithful I mean exactly that like right off the pages of history and presented on screen are the real engagements, formations, cavalry charges, and the tactics used by the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon Bonaparte. This is a film that even the most hardcore history buff can enjoy. And the amount- And this is why I don't understand, like, listen, I understand, and I say this all the time, that when we're making adaptations for the screen of historic events, certain things just have to happen. A uh, common example they use is in Band of Brothers, for example. Um, they condensed characters because like, our, our attention span only goes so far. And, and we're not going to remember the names and backstories of all 140 original Tokoa guys from Band of Brothers. So they have certain characters that we get to know. And then those guys say things sometimes that other people said. And they said sometimes they would take their helmet off when they never would have done so in real life because it helps the person watching to identify who that person is. Those kinds of things have to happen. But it seems like so often things get changed and there's really no reason to have changed it because telling the real story the way it really happened would be just as if not more compelling and then you wouldn't get the argument that you you changed the history. So, you know, Waterloo is not perfect. It doesn't do everything exactly right. And and obviously the timeline's condensed because the battle lasted a lot longer than the movie does. But they get a lot more right than almost anything else that has been made. The amount of work that went into it is nothing short of astonishing. Shot entirely in the Ukraine, the filmmakers used 16,000 soldiers from the Soviet Red Army. Look at look at those squares. Look at the squares and the actual cap. This is all real. These are all real people that you're seeing in this movie. As background extras. So that means every single soldier you see on the screen at any given time is a real person. And these overhead this shots. This is the largest and most accurate reenacted battle you will ever see from the Napoleonic era. This is Waterloo. Oh, I get chills just looking at it. Plus, I'm going to the Waterloo battlefield in July, so uh, we're going to be covering the battle. We're going to be covering some archaeological work that's going on there. Super excited. After 20 years of almost constant warfare, the first French Empire was on its very last legs. By March 1814, 
the combined armies of Great Britain, Austria, Prussia and Russia had invaded France and were almost at the very gates of Paris. And yet only two years before, Napoleon Bonaparte's empire was at its very height. Almost all of Western Europe was under his total dominion as he ruled the lives of over 60 million subjects. Not since the days of the Roman Empire had such a thing ever been achieved. At every turn, Napoleon's military genius had crushed the most powerful nations in Europe. The only one that continued to defy him was Great Britain. Yep. His original plans of invading the stubborn island nation were scrapped after a spectacular defeat at the Battle of Trafalgar. With much of his navy having been destroyed, the French Emperor chose to go instead after his bitter rival with a very different weapon, economics. Napoleon introduced the very unpopular continental system, which was a foreign policy that forbade all conquered and allied nations of France to trade with Great Britain. And this, you know, we talk all the time about how history doesn't always repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Uh, this is hardly the first and it won't be the last time that nations that can't compete with the British uh, on the seas with their navy have to find other ways to combat British blockades. In this case, the British blockade is combated with the uh, continental system and it's going to lead directly to Napoleon's decision to invade Russia. It's directly tied to the British blockade and the fact that Russia kind of violates the continental system. Same thing in World War I, where the British blockade of German ports is going to lead directly to Germany doing what I think is very reasonable given the circumstances and launching unrestricted submarine warfare, which is then going to lead in part to the United States entering the war. And so the British Navy time and time again causes their enemies on land who can't compete with them to resort to things that end up backfiring on them. The idea behind this was that either Great Britain would eventually sue for peace or suffer an economic collapse and would be weak enough to be invaded at a later time. However, this embargo would prove to be more disruptive to the economies of France and her allies. In comparison, it was largely ineffective against British trade. The reason for this was that trade was still coming into the continent. One source was through Spain and Portugal, which of course helped set off the Peninsula War, and by 1810, Russia had also reopened trade with Great Britain. This act of defiance would be Napoleon's primary incentive in making the gravest mistake in his career. Against the advice of his friends and loved ones, he declared war on Russia. See, the, the idea of the continental system only works if you can enforce it and if you can deal with the violators of it. And so he has to do this. He has to, to go after the people who are violating it or nobody's going to abide by it. Do not go to Russia. You're at the height of your glory. From Portugal to Poland, almost all Europe is yours. You rule over the destiny of over 60 million men. So what you're seeing here are clips from, I think this is the TV miniseries Napoleon, which is also really, really good. All of it is better than what we got from Ridley Scott this year. Do not go to Russia. On the 24th of June, 1812, Napoleon's Grand Army invaded Russia with over 600,000 men. Aside from a few battles with the French, the Russian army focused on retreating and applying a scorched earth tactic of burning crops, towns and villages denying Napoleon's army the ability to live off the land and to rely solely on their overextended supply line. As the French were lured further and further into Russia, they finally caught up with the Russian army at Borodino, a small town 70 miles from Moscow. This was to be the biggest and bloodiest battle of the Napoleonic War so far. Yep. Russian resistance was fierce and Napoleon didn't rely so much on his usual brilliant military strategy as much as just funneling more and more French soldiers into the slaughter. Both sides were taking massive casualties until finally the Russian army retreated once again and was able to slip away in the night. And I'm not talking too much about this stuff because this is stuff we've covered in other videos. And at the end of this video, as well as down in the description, I'll put some links to some of the videos, the other, the beginnings of some series where we've gone into detail about some of these events in the Napoleonic Wars. Although Napoleon had taken Borodino, he hadn't achieved the decisive victory he desperately needed. After the battle, the Grand Armée pushed onto the city of Moscow, but found it almost completely abandoned, and the streets were eerily silent. Later that evening, as Napoleon and his army rested after months of marching and bitter fighting, hundreds of arsonists set fire to the city. 
Not even the holy capital was exempt from the Tsar's scorched earth policy. Two thirds of the city would burn to the ground, proving to Napoleon that the Russians would never give up and a decisive victory was nowhere in sight. Yep. The Grand Army was forced to retreat and began the long march back to France. Then things only went from bad to worse as the Russian winter came in. Temperatures plummeted well below freezing and the French died by the thousands as they froze and starved to death. Of the 600,000 men who went into Russia, only 28,000 returned. This was to be and that in and of itself should have been the end, and it really was. I mean, for all intents and purposes, that's the end of Napoleon's empire. But he still manages to scrape together another army. He still managed to, manages to fight and win some more victories. But uh, really, that's the beginning of the end. And, and, and as much as we focus on Waterloo as being the defeat of Napoleon, uh, I say this all the time, Waterloo was not the decisive battle of the Napoleonic Wars. There are many other battles that we can point to as being that. We can point to Leipzig, we can point to Russia, we could even point to the Peninsular War as being where those things happen. If, if Napoleon had somehow scraped together a victory at Waterloo, there would have been another Waterloo and another Waterloo. There was no scenario in 1815 in which Napoleon comes out of there with his empire intact. Be the beginning of the end for Napoleon's empire as Prussia and Austria would declare war once again. Napoleon would fight a losing defensive campaign for the next two years until finally the armies of Great Britain, Austria, Prussia and Russia were now on French soil. And this is where the movie begins. With the once mighty Grand Armée being virtually destroyed, Napoleon's general stated that the situation was hopeless and the only choice now was to abdicate the throne. We are defeated, sire. For 20 years we followed you. You made a road of glory through Europe. We cannot even save the suburbs of Paris. The Austrians. They're in Versailles. The Cossacks are watering the horses in the Seine. They can hear the Prussian cannon in Montmartre. There are four nations, four armies, for France against us. Just even this opening scene is just so fantastic. And, and they got like, I mean, Christopher Plummer to play, um, to play Wellington. And the guy, the actor here who look, who plays Marshall Ney looks just like him. Uh, it's just all so well done. Abdicate. Your enemies will allow you to retire to the island of Elba with a personal guard of a thousand men. It is an honorable exile, sire. Napoleon begrudgingly signed the treaty, renouncing the throne. At a heartfelt ceremony, Napoleon handpicked his most loyal soldiers from the old guard and said his goodbyes to the rest. So that opening, that, that scene with the the marshals standing there, it obviously didn't go down exactly like that, but that is... It's a storytelling device to have his marshals standing there explaining, oh, your enemies will let you exile to Elba and all these things like that. They're just kind of explaining that part without having to show it all. Soldiers! Of my old guard! After 20 years, I have come to say... I, I love even this. How many times in movies do you get this scene and you get the, the general talking at a conversational level because it's more aesthetically pleasing to the watcher of the, the movie? But that wouldn't have happened. When you're speaking to a full courtyard of people like that, you have to shout it. This is exactly what he would have had to do. So even the attention to detail on things like that, I really like. The men trying to look stoic, but also the tears welling up. France has fallen! So remember me! Though I love you all, I cannot embrace you all. 
And so on May 1814, the Emperor of France left on a British warship become the emperor of a tiny island in the Mediterranean to live out the rest of his life in isolation. This really should have been the end of his story, but by one of the most dramatic twists of fate in history, Napoleon had one more fight left in him. This would take place in a field near Waterloo. The enemy of humanity. Hardly. When Napoleon abdicated the throne, the Allied coalition wasted no time in restoring the old French monarchy, placing Louis XVIII as king. At first, the French people welcomed the peace as they were quite frankly fed up by that point of Napoleon's endless wars. So Louis XVIII is actually a brother to Louis XVI. Uh, it can be confusing because of the numbers and having the same name, but he's a brother. He's, he's this kind of fat old man who um, really nobody wants him to be king. But it was the only way they were going to get the wars to stop. I mean, the, the Napoleonic Wars begin not because Napoleon rises to power and wants to conquer Europe, but because the nations of Europe want to defeat this upstart French Republic who uh, threatens the entire st the stability of the monarchies of Europe just by its existence. Uh, and then it's out of those wars that Napoleon rises to power in these early wars of the coalition, and then he goes on the offensive. But eventually, King Louis became extremely unpopular with many of the changes he had made, such as demobilizing the army, raising taxes to help resolve France's poor economy, and the royalists were threatened to rescind many of the political reforms made during the revolution. But in quite See, that's the thing people forget, too. Napoleon's not just a military genius. He has completely reformed the way government works and the way institutions work. And many of those reforms exist to this day uh, or were inherited and then further reformed. Uh, he completely revamped Europe in his image, I guess you could say. Not really in his image, but, but Europe is never the same after Napoleon possibly the greatest comeback of all time. On February 26th, 1815, Napoleon and his personal guard fled Elba and sailed to France. He had figured correctly that his return would be immediately welcomed and supported by the French people once again. King Louis immediately ordered Field Marshal Ney to stop Napoleon on his march to Paris. Oops. On the 14th of March, Field Marshal Ney's regiment confronted Napoleon and his personal guard. Just as fighting was about to kick off, Napoleon ordered his men to lower their arms, and something incredible happened. If you want to kill your emperor, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> See, Napoleon was always, he was never one of those generals who was all high and mighty and disconnected from his men. We say all the time, you know, he, he had that nickname, the little corporal, because that's how his men saw him. It, it wasn't a derogatory thing. It was he was one of them. Uh, he it, some of the early battles where he leads an army, he is right on the front lines in the danger with his men. These men would follow him in anywhere. And he, he counted on that. There's the moment of what's going to happen. But he knew. He knew they'd never fire on him. Fire! Vive la France! It's unbelievable, I know, but this is exactly what happened. Yep. And not just this one time. When King Louis heard that Marshal Ney and his men deserted him, he would send more troops. And the exact same thing would happen again and again. And we should point out here that Marshal Ney, after Napoleon's downfall, will be arrested, tried for treason, and executed. Napoleon's numbers swelled from a few regiments to an entire army, all of them marching towards Paris. Eventually, King Louis figured out in the end that it was probably not a good idea to stick around, and he fled the country. Napoleon's gamble had paid off, and he had retaken France, all without firing a shot. The people welcomed back their old emperor with open arms. 
When news reached the rest of Europe, the old allies of Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia were stunned. And keep in mind that as Napoleon's coming back, they're still kind of wrapping up the Congress of Vienna. And so a lot of these armies are still, at least in part, out in the field. A lot of the representatives of these governments are in Central Europe at this time. So they're, they're able to kind of coordinate and respond pretty quickly. Initially, Napoleon sent letters to each and every one of them asking for peace. They, of course, rejected it because they knew that Napoleon was only buying time and that he was simply not yet ready to fight. So instead, they sent him their polite response. Well, they've done it. Declared me an enemy of humanity. All Europe has declared war against me. Not against France, but against me. They dignify you, sire, by making you a nation. No shit. How badass do you have to be to have an entire continent declare war against you? So anyway, Napoleon knew that he had little time before the old allies had mobilized a new coalition against him. Whilst they just had to organize their armies together, Napoleon had to practically build one from scratch. Yeah. And within three months, he had raised nearly 200,000 men. However, the allies he would face had mustered over half a million and were getting ready to attack France from multiple directions. So, Napoleon being Napoleon, decided the best defense was a good offense. So just kind of soak this in for a minute. You've got... Uh, an army down here on the Rhine, 225,000 men. You got 23,000 opposing them. You got 20,000 in Paris. You got Napoleon with 126,000. You got Wellington and Blucher here with almost equal numbers to that. So imagine just for one second that Napoleon defeats Wellington and Blucher. Okay. You still got Schwarzenberg here. You got Barclay coming with another 168,000. You've got more men down in southern, uh, the southern part of France. There, there's no scenario where Napoleon has enough men to keep fending off these armies, and they weren't going to stop. He hoped that if he was able to take on each Allied army individually before moving on to the next, then his request for peace would have to be accepted. And that's the only real scenario here is that it's an outlast situation. If you can defeat one, then defeat another, and hopefully they don't reform and hit you again, and you just get them to say, you know what, the bloodshed is just not worth it. Let Napoleon stay on his throne, let him rule France, and then sue for peace. It was a long shot, though. And so on June 15th, 1815... Napoleon crossed the Belgian border with nearly 130,000 men to reach the Allied armies near Brussels. There were the Prussians led by Marshal Blücher and the Anglo-Allied army led by Sir Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. Napoleon had to Who is, by the way, the uncle to King Charles III. Uh, his brother was one of Queen Elizabeth II's ancestors, like a great-great-grandfather, maybe three greats. ...sure that they didn't join and overwhelm him with their greater numbers. At first, his strategy of divide and conquer seemed to be working. On June 16th, he crushed a small Prussian force, sending them on a complete retreat. Proceed! Gérard! You take 30,000 men. 30,000 men, one third of my army. You take them in and you pursue, you understand? You pursue Blucher. You don't let them regroup, you don't let them consolidate, and above all, you don't let them rejoin! With the Prussian army seemingly out of the way, Napoleon focused next on reaching the British allies. On June 17th, Wellington had set his army on top of a ridge line overlooking a valley near the village of Waterloo. In the valley were the two chateaux, Hougamont and Les Haissons. These two fortified farmhouses would be occupied by British and Allied sharpshooters. They're... It's such a fascinating battlefield. I can't wait to go there myself this summer. Uh, obviously, it has changed somewhat since then. They got that big, god awful hill in the center but um, that they built. But. Uh, it really is just like imagine two hilltops with the armies on them and then the valley in between. It's very reminiscent of the David and Goliath story from the Bible where the Philistines are on one hill and the Israelites are on the other and the Valley of Elah below is where David and Goliath fight. Uh, it's kind of what happens here. Objective was to delay any French advance on the main army. Now with these two defensive positions, the ridge line giving him a natural shelter from French artillery fire, all Wellington had to do was hold his ground and wait for the Prussians. As the French army had positioned themselves during the night, Wellington expected that the battle would start by daybreak. 
much to his surprise. And in hindsight, I mean, uh, he's going to talk about why, uh, because of the rain and everything, but every hour that this battle delays is more time for the Prussians to come up and hit Napoleon on his flank. I have to wonder how the battle is different if the attack does start in the morning or if it doesn't rain the night before. Maybe Napoleon wins this battle. Surprise, though, the French made no such movement as the hours began to drag. The reason for this was that the previous heavy night's rain had made the ground too muddy to put any cannons into position. Napoleon had no choice but to wait until the ground dried, costing him valuable time. Just look at these scenes. I, I realize that the resolution's not the best, and so it's hard to see it in these shots. But these are all real people. And what's cool about it is when you watch the movie, like you see the sun reflecting off of the, uh, the bayonets and things like that. Little details you wouldn't necessarily get in a CGI version of this. Uh, it's so, so cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, Napoleon's an artillery guy. And so he relies very heavily on his mastery of artillery for battles like this. The longer he waited the more time Wellington had in receiving reinforcements. When the battle finally kicked off, it was already past 11. The French army started by attacking Hougoumont and Wellington's right flank. This was only a feint though. Napoleon hoped that Wellington would send his reserves for support and in the process, weaken his center where the main attack was coming. But Wellington had predicted this move since he had studied many of Napoleon's victories in the past and was not going to fall for his trap. He's committed Foyle's division now, sir. He intends to turn us on the right. What the master seems to intend and what he does will be as different as white knight to black bishop. We can quickly move the 95th down, sir. I do not intend to run around like a wet hen. <laughs> Send sharp in the 95th rifles. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is where it's so important to know your enemy. And this is why the longer Napoleon has to fight in these wars, the more disadvantageous his situation is going to become. Not only because he's going to be ground down and he's going to go from veteran experienced soldiers to new uh, conscripts who aren't as good, uh, but also because the more he fights against his enemies, the more his enemies are going to learn his moves and learn how to counter them. Bougamont saw some of the most intensive and continuous fighting throughout the battle. However, the Allied garrison didn't buckle despite being heavily outnumbered. When Napoleon saw that Wellington had not taken the bait, he ordered an all-out artillery barrage. After softening them up, he sent in his infantry to smash through the Allied center. Despite being heavily bombarded earlier, the British line was able to hold on and inflict heavy casualties against the marching French columns. As the French retreated, the British heavy cavalry charged after them. But in the heat of battle, the Scots Greys had charged too far and were pounded by French cannon fire before being counterattacked themselves by French cavalry. Back! Get back! Sound the call! They were able to make it back to the ridge but had suffered terribly. At this point, thousands of lives had already been lost, yeah. but neither side had gained ground. Meanwhile, Marshal Grouchy was still chasing after the Prussians. My God, sir, the cannon are calling us. March to the sound of the guns. We are a third of the army. Our duty is to... Do not presume to teach me my duty, General Gerard. My orders from the Emperor were precise. To keep my sword in Blucher's back. What Grouchy hadn't realized yet was that his force had been chasing after the Prussian rearguard yep. and the rest of Blucher's army had given him the slip. La Bedoyer! Yes, sir. What's moving there? Is going, dude? <laughs> yes. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yes, Napoleon is in that. Classic movie from my younger years. You definitely should check it out. Keanu Reeves. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to do that. Just to check if you were paying attention. So, if you're not familiar with Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure... It's a long story, but the the gist of it is that these guys, in order to pass a history uh, project, they are they are given the opportunity. Uh, George Carlin is the the actor who plays the guy who comes to their rescue because they're important for the f for the future of humanity, uh, and and gives them a time machine and they go back and they kidnap people like Abraham Lincoln and Beethoven and Genghis Khan and Napoleon and they bring them to the present to help them with their history project. No, it's not Bill and Ted. It's, of course, the Prussians. That's not necessary. That's not necessary. It's the Prussians. 
But as far as you and I are concerned, and the army, they're on the moon. Is that understood? Yes, sir. This Wellington wages war in a new way. He fights sitting on his ass. Well, we'll have to move him off it. Later on, Field Marshal Ney saw the Allies move behind the ridge line. Thinking that they were retreating, he ordered a massive charge of 12,000 cavalrymen, hoping to cause a rout amongst Wellington's wavering army. And this is the iconic part of the battle most people think of, is the charge of the French cavalry and the, uh, the British and Allied infantry forming into squares. What he didn't know, though, was that the Allies were waiting for them on the other side of the ridge and had laid a trap. Withdraw to square! Shoot up the horses! Pile up the horses! This is, if you imagine warfare, this is really oversimplifying, but imagine it like a game of rock, paper, scissors. Your cavalry is uh, its weakness is this uh, infantry forming squares because the cavalry, the horses are just going to naturally ride around them. And, and they weren't like one or two guys deep. Like these are massive, formidable obstacles of squares with bayonets. And, and it's just the cavalry can't deal with that. And so they ride around and then you just pick them off and shoot them to pieces. But the squares are incredibly vulnerable then to artillery. But when they're on the other side of the hill and the artillery can't see or get to them, they're protected from that. So you're neutralizing, uh, like if you're paper and you're covering the rock of the cavalry, you're neutralizing the scissors that could cut up your, your squares. Look at that. That's so cool. And see how the cavalry ride around them. They won't ride into them. It's not like what you see in Lord of the Rings where the, the heavy cavalry all ride right into all the pikes and just overrun them. Now, horses just by nature tend to ride around. Ney, in his overeager attempt to win glory on the battlefield, had made a terrible mistake. Without infantry and artillery support, his men were easy targets. This was because the British square formations were the perfect defense against cavalry. The reason for this was because horses simply refused to charge into a line of men holding bayonets and muskets. They will instead ride around the squares, leaving them vulnerable to musket fire from other square formations. Without being able to break through the squares, Ney had no choice but to retreat. Napoleon by this point was desperate, as the Prussians had finally arrived and were closing in on his army's right flank. And one last thing about the squares, the reason that those are then vulnerable to artillery is because you're dealing primarily with solid shot. And if you've got a square formation that's four or five rows deep, and then maybe behind them there's another several rows, and you fire solid shot into that, it's an easy way of taking out a whole bunch of men at one time. He sent troops to slow the Prussians down and ordered an infantry attack on La Haison that was being defended by the King's German Legion. Despite their courageous efforts, they were overwhelmed by the French. Having taken the chateau, Napoleon was now free to commence... <laughs> when I see this scene where they're up on the roof, all I can think of is that game that I used to play on the gaming channel all the time, um, where you actually are playing as a soldier in the Napoleonic Wars and you can climb up on those very roofs. It's pretty cool. It's his final attack that would finish the Allies off. Wellington's beaten. He's bled to death. Now, now move the old guard forward, then on to Brussels. Now the old guard were Napoleon's best soldiers. They were all veterans and throughout the Napoleonic Wars had never surrendered or been defeated in battle. However, that's probably because Napoleon didn't like to use them very much. Look at how many people are in that shot. Those are all real people. There's no CGI there. That is insane. Just their presence on the field was a huge morale boost to the rest of the army. Normally, he didn't want to test the myth of their invulnerability, but on this occasion, he had no choice. The old guard marched towards the Allied center, and with La Haison safely in French hands, there appeared to be very little standing in their way. And here's the thing, when you're part of that old guard and there is that, that mythological quality to your invulnerability, that can go to your head. Uh, it's it's kind of like the, the same idea that had kind of gotten into the minds of Robert E. Lee and his army by the time they get to Gettysburg. We're unbeatable. 
We have defeated men on so many battlefields against overwhelming odds at places like Chancellorsville. So then when it comes time for Pickett's Charge, they just think they can do anything. And that's going to kind of bite them a little bit here when it's obvious that they should quit and the battle's lost. They're not going to accept that. But Wellington had one last trick up his sleeve. Now, Maitland! Now's your time! Those first volleys were devastating at point-blank range. Wiping out 20% of the old guard in one go and this amount of firepower would prove to be too much. First the old guard began to retreat, but when the rest of the French army saw the myth of their invulnerability shatter, the retreat caused the entire army to panic and rout. Right. If, if they can't stand up to it, how can us regular conscripted soldiers have a chance? If I ever saw 30,000 men run a race before. The whole line will advance in... Love Christopher direction, Plummer. Your grace. Why straight ahead, to be sure. Any semblance of order in the French army evaporated as both the Allies and the Prussians bared down on them. Napoleon had to accept the truth that he had been beaten and he fled on a carriage back to Paris. After nine hours and close to 70,000 dead on both sides, the Battle of Waterloo was... It wasn't 70,000 dead. This is... I really... Maybe it's because I am a student of military history and, I, and not everyone is. It drives me nuts to no end that people can't tell the difference between casualties and dead. A casualty is anybody who's been taken out. If you get wounded and you survive, you're still a casualty. So casualties are killed, mortally wounded. In other words, people who are wounded but are still alive but will die later. The wounded, people who maybe have a flesh wound all the way up to people who, uh, who lose a limb or something. And the captured and the missing, it's all of that. 70,000 is the casualty figure. In fact, let's look at these numbers. Here you go. So you're looking at casualties on the French side, 26, 27,000. That's 25,000 killed or wounded, plus another 8,000 captured, 15,000 deserted after the battle. Wellington's army has 17,000 killed, wounded, or missing. Uh, and then specifically, they give a number of about 3,500 killed. So uh, the same thing's true with, like, say, the Battle of Gettysburg. Gettysburg, there are about 51,000 casualties, but only about 7,000 of them are killed outright. Now, there'll be several thousand more that die afterwards, but there's only 3,500 Union dead buried in the National Cemetery. There's not 30,000 dead buried there because it's not casualties, it's deaths. Okay, rant over. Let's continue. It was finally over. Normally when I make these videos, historical accuracy is always at the forefront of my mind. In fact, it pretty much dominates my reviews. However, during my research of Waterloo, it has been pretty difficult. In fact, you could say that I've been wonderfully frustrated just how accurate this movie is. On one hand, I love this movie for that, but it gives me very little to work with as a writer. For the most part, what you see on the screen is pretty much exactly how it all went down. Now, of course there are some inaccuracies here and there, but nothing that compares to what we usually get in other historical movies. And, and like I said at the beginning, so, sometimes these inaccuracies, they're not intentional... Uh, twisting of events for some nefarious purpose they're just practical issues practically speaking when you're making a, a tv show or a movie you just the nature of the medium requires you to change certain things in order to make the experience viable for your audience i point a few of them out as examples but to be honest they really don't bother me like for example waterloo shows us the famous duchess of richmond's ball that really did take place on June 15th in Brussels. So what's the inaccuracy here? It didn't take place in a lavish ballroom like we see in the movie, but something more like a converted coach house or a barn. So yeah, I, I, I couldn't care less about that. I mean, as far as inaccuracies goes, that's pretty tame. Another one is when we see British soldiers sing a song about Napoleon.
The reason why this song is inaccurate is because it's a song that details the entire life story of Napoleon, from his early school days to Waterloo and his exile to St Helena. It was actually written in the 1820s and couldn't have been sung in Waterloo. Bonnie, he was sent away, away, uh, away in St Helena, Jean-Francois. Yet again, inaccuracies such as these don't really bother me. Unlike some other ones. It's round. The only other big inaccuracy in the movie that I can think of, that I didn't miss anyway, is the awesome badass scene where the British ask the old guard to oh, surrender. Yeah. Brave Frenchman! You have done all that the honor of war requires. His Grace the Duke of Wellington invites you to save your lives. Will you agree to surrender? So the guy who shouted merde is the historical figure Pierre Cambrone. He allegedly shouted merde, which means shit in French, or he said, please excuse my poor French, le garde me et ne se rompe pas, which means the guard dies and does not surrender. This was reported by a journalist called Rougemont. However, Pierre did not die at Waterloo like he's shown in the movie. He was taken prisoner and stated until his dying day that he never said either statement. But. What's really funny is that when Pierre died, the French just ignored him and slapped it on his statue anyway. It was like they were saying, no, 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 bullshit, you said it. Look, see, we put it on your statue, it's set in stone now. So, once again, this doesn't bother me because it's a really cool scene. And it's a story that, even though we're pretty sure it didn't happen, did get told about the battle, so, all right. I love the fact that even the inaccuracies are somewhat based on history. Yep. It just shows you how much the filmmakers cared about this time period. Yeah. And, for the most part, accurately bring it to life. I don't think we will ever see this much care and attention put into a historical film again. From a production Look standpoint, that. Look at that. it's insane. Oh my gosh. To recreate the battlefield, awesome. they bulldozed two hills, planted 5,000 trees, rebuilt Oogmont and Le Haison, and laid down five miles of road. And by using the 16,000 soldiers from the Soviet army, they spent months teaching them Napoleon. I was going to say, these soldiers actually learned Napoleonic tactics for all of this. Napoleonic drill formations, how to march accurately, which a lot of films don't bother with, by the way, and teaching them how to load and fire muskets and cannons. If this was made today, all of this would be CGI and would look like crap. Nothing can compare to the real thing. God. Little tiny details like the sunlight glinting off an army's weapons yep. wouldn't even occur to computer animators. And what's ultimately sad in the end is that they will never make a film like Waterloo again. In the past 46 years, I have seen no other film that has come close to what this one has achieved. That's why Waterloo has such a special place in my heart. It's Mine too. And I, I think you can find it online pretty easily. I may, I may even be maybe a low resolution version, but is available on YouTube. It's absolutely. If you have any interest whatsoever in 19th century European warfare, it's a must watch, an absolute must watch. And it will help you to cleanse the bad taste of Ridley Scott's Napoleon out of your mouth a little bit. It even inspired me to come up with the concept of history buffs. The Scots Great Charge is one of my favorite paintings, mm. and when I saw it being recreated on film, it always stayed with me. It was like seeing history come to life. All right, fantastic stuff. Like I said, I, I cannot praise that movie enough. It's really that good. Let me know your thoughts, though, in the comment section below, because, listen, I'm not an expert on Waterloo, on Napoleonic Warfare, or anything like that. I'm going to be studying Waterloo a lot over the next couple of months as I gear up for my, my trip to the battlefield to be part of that uh, Waterloo Uncovered project uh, that they're doing. But um, I have a lot to learn still on that. So 
let me know uh, in the conversation below. Let's use uh, this opportunity to talk more about it. Uh, check out some links in the description, but also up on the screen here in just a minute to some of our video series about the Napoleonic Wars. Thanks for watching.